the atomic impulse life winning now unleash your inner power chapter one effort enthusiasts i like my job and am good at it but it sure grinds me down sometimes and the last thing i need to take home is a headache anison tv commercial on a cold rainy october morning edward kennedy stood by a factory gate seeking votes for the u.s senate as he greeted one elderly worker and asked for his vote the employee looked at Kennedy and said, I understand you never worked a day in your life. Before Kennedy had a chance to reply, the worker added, Well, let me tell you, you haven't missed a damn thing. What does work mean to you? Do you think of work as an activity that takes more from you than it gives? Do you see the distinction between play and work as the difference between pleasure and pain? Do you live to work, or do you work to live? Regardless of your answers, one thing is certain. Work is here to stay. By work, I mean the human expenditure of time and energy, both physical and mental, to complete a task. This definition is broad, encompassing the overwhelming majority of your waking hours. When you brush your teeth, plan a vacation, drive to work, or perform household or occupational chores, you are at work. You might work at being a better doctor, lawyer, teacher, tennis player, lover, or cook. Work, like death and taxes, is an all-encompassing and inescapable reality of life. Now for the good news. The forthcoming pages contain a comprehensive set of simple but powerful ideas and techniques that will enable you to conquer your personal energy crisis. Do you ever feel frustrated and exhausted at the end of the day because you have nothing to show for your efforts? I'll show you some simple ideas that will make every day count and leave you with time and energy to spare. Do you find yourself rushing to meet deadlines and constantly hassled by an unending stream of crises? I'll give you some ways to beat the deadline hassle and cut down on your firefighting activities. Is your life one big mass of commitments that leave you feeling confused and immobilized? I'll show you how to organize those commitments, eliminate many, and give yourself a sense of direction. Do you find yourself feeling guilty about what doesn't get done and worried about what may not get done? I'll convince you that these are useless emotions that only cause you to work more and accomplish less. Do you find yourself not tackling important projects because they seem overwhelming or unpleasant? I'll explain how you can gain momentum to tackle these projects and follow through to successful completion. Are you compulsive about having to do everything yourself? I'll give you some tips on successful delegating. In working with others, do you often find the going rough due to communication breakdowns and unnecessary conflicts? I'll point out some common pitfalls of communication and conflict and recommend means of avoiding them. Do you find your work hampered by an unending stream of interruptions such as meetings, visitors, and telephone calls? I'll give you some pointers for minimizing them. Are you drowning in a sea of information and paper overload, as most of us are? I'll show you how to quiet the paper tiger down to a mild roar. To be sure, this is a large order, but I am confident that you will benefit from many, if not all, of the ideas contained here. And the best part is that they are simple, proven, and immediately applicable. Effectiveness, the key to it all. As you read this, you may be thinking that this is a book written by some efficiency nut who wants to turn you into an unfeeling, unthinking automaton. Nothing could be further from the truth. All too often, many of us confuse effectiveness with efficiency. Being effective means choosing the right goals from a set of alternatives and reaching them. Efficiency, on the other hand, assumes the goals as given and proper and proceeds to find the best means of achieving them. Efficiency is doing the job right, whereas effectiveness is doing the right job. In a nutshell, effectiveness means results. Both are valuable concepts, but in my mind, effectiveness is far more important. What's your time worth? See Figure 1. Benjamin Franklin told us that time is money, and in the business sense, this is true. Time is like money in that it is measurable, and you can't take it with you. However, as a resource, time has unique properties. We are forced to use time at a constant rate. The inventory is being depleted at an amount of 60 minutes per hour, 24 hours per day, 168 hours per week. Time is irreplaceable. We are all given a finite amount of time, but the irony is that we never know how much we have until it's all gone. Few of us admit to having enough time, but all of us have all that there is, that is the paradox of time. Time is truly our most precious resource. How old are you? How many more years do you expect to live? When you die, how long will you be dead? 
I ask these questions not to depress you but rather to impress you with the briefness of our earthly existence. Waste your money, and you're only out of money, but waste your time, and you've lost a part of your life. Few of us would knowingly take half of our take-home pay and spend it on something that was of absolutely no use to us or anyone else. However, the vast majority of us spend at least 50% of each day in various pastimes that provide no earthly use or satisfaction for anyone, including ourselves. We literally waste away half of our lives and do it in oblivious indifference. Coming to grips with our mortality can help us or hurt us. If we choose to let it hurt us, we can wallow in the futility and tragedy of life. We can conclude that life isn't worth living. Or, as most of us do, we can fool ourselves into believing that our time is infinite, that there will always be tomorrow to fulfill those lifetime dreams and wishes. Fortunately, there are a few of us who deal with our mortality in a more constructive way. These people say to themselves, I'm not going to be here forever, so I'd better make the most of every minute, hour, day, and year. They view life as a brief but wonderful experience to be enjoyed to the fullest. They live their lives for themselves because they accept the reality that their life is all they have. They accept the responsibility for their own feelings, triumphs, and misfortunes. As a result of this take-charge attitude, these persons realize the necessity to plan their lives for maximum personal satisfaction. To make the most of your future time and energy, it is imperative that you devote some of your present time and energy to planning. Without sound plans to increase our personal effectiveness, most of us tend to drift and stagnate. Some people believe that planning is merely deciding what to do in the future. However, a better definition of planning is deciding what you have to do in order to have a future. The Investment Theory of Work Simply put, the investment theory of work states that you must be willing to sacrifice some of your present time, energy, and short-range satisfactions in order to work less and accomplish more later on. There is nothing new or earth-shaking about the investment theory of work, and all of us have used it from time to time. When you take a part-time job in addition to your regular duties to save for that new house or car, or when you go back to school for additional or advanced training, you are applying the investment theory. Most of us, however, don't rely on it systematically as a working principle in our lives. The reason for this is what I call the instant everything lifestyle. This has become a prevailing norm in our society. Pick up any newspaper, turn on the radio or television, or drive down any suburban highway, and voices from the land of instant everything will announce their readiness to satisfy your every need. Are you hungry or thirsty? There are fast food restaurants and express checkout supermarkets by the score. Dislike the way you are? There are literally thousands of establishments crying to make you taller, shorter, lighter, heavier, sexier, healthier, more beautiful, and smell better. Want to change your mood? There are pills and potions to pick you up, bring you down, keep you awake, and put you to sleep. The list could go on endlessly. It's the incredible miracle of 20th century living. One of the problems with instant everything is that it lulls us into neglecting the future. All that matters is the urgency of satisfying present needs. However, the future is not instant. It runs on a very precise schedule and takes its time getting here. To be sure, tomorrow is promised to no one, but it is also a fact that most of us will be here when it arrives. Fail to control your future, and it will control you. Your use of time and energy will be dictated by circumstances rather than by yourself. The relationship of you to time is always one of master to slave. There is no middle ground. The only question is which role you choose to play. Many of the ideas suggested in this book will at first be unfamiliar and uncomfortable, and involve a greater initial investment of work than old comfortable habits you have grown accustomed to. However, as the Queen told Alice in Lewis Carroll's Through the Looking Glass, it's a poor sort of memory that only works backwards. As your two-way memory looks forward, you will realize the rewards are indeed greater accomplishment coupled with less devotion of your time and energy. I happen to be one of those people who believe that happiness and success don't just happen to someone. They happen when opportunity meets preparation. Those who succeed do so because they were willing to invest in the groundwork and were prepared when the tide of good fortune rolled in. Working smart requires an investment of thought, self-discipline, and hard work, and the rewards are greater personal satisfaction and greater productivity with less stress and less effort. A word of warning. Old habits are extremely hard to break. Your first reaction to some of these new ideas may be to try them for a while and then give them up in favor of the old ways.
Are you drowning in a sea of information and paper overload, as most of us are? I'll show you how to quiet the paper tiger down to a mild roar. To be sure, this is a large order, but I am confident that you will benefit from many, if not all, of the ideas contained here. And the best part is that they are simple, proven, and immediately applicable. Effectiveness, the key to it all. As you read this, you may be thinking that this is a book written by some efficiency nut who wants to turn you into an unfeeling, unthinking automaton. Nothing could be further from the truth. All too often, many of us confuse effectiveness with efficiency. Being effective means choosing the right goals from a set of alternatives and reaching them. Efficiency, on the other hand, assumes the goals as given and proper and proceeds to find the best means of achieving them. Efficiency is doing the job right, whereas effectiveness is doing the right job. In a nutshell, effectiveness means results. Both are valuable concepts, but in my mind, effectiveness is far more important. What's your time worth? See Figure 1. Benjamin Franklin told us that time is money, and in the business sense, this is true. Time is like money in that it is measurable, and you can't take it with you. However, as a resource, time has unique properties. We are forced to use time at a constant rate. The inventory is being depleted at an amount of 60 minutes per hour, 24 hours per day, 168 hours per week. Time is irreplaceable. We are all given a finite amount of time, but the irony is that we never know how much we have until it's all gone. Few of us admit to having enough time, but all of us have all that there is, that is the paradox of time. Time is truly our most precious resource. How old are you? How many more years do you expect to live? When you die, how long will you be dead? I ask these questions not to depress you but rather to impress you with the briefness of our earthly existence. Waste your money, and you're only out of money, but waste your time, and you've lost a part of your life. Few of us would knowingly take half of our take-home pay and spend it on something that was of absolutely no use to us or anyone else. However, the vast majority of us spend at least 50% of each day in various pastimes that provide no earthly use or satisfaction for anyone, including ourselves. We literally waste away half of our lives and do it in oblivious indifference. Coming to grips with our mortality can help us or hurt us. If we choose to let it hurt us, we can wallow in the futility and tragedy of life. We can conclude that life isn't worth living. Or, as most of us do, we can fool ourselves into believing that our time is infinite, that there will always be tomorrow to fulfill those lifetime dreams and wishes. Fortunately, there are a few of us who deal with our mortality in a more constructive way. These people say to themselves, I'm not going to be here forever, so I'd better make the most of every minute, hour, day, and year. They view life as a brief but wonderful experience to be enjoyed to the fullest. They live their lives for themselves because they accept the reality that their life is all they have. They accept the responsibility for their own feelings, triumphs, and misfortunes. As a result of this take-charge attitude, these persons realize the necessity to plan their lives for maximum personal satisfaction. To make the most of your future time and energy, it is imperative that you devote some of your present time and energy to planning. Without sound plans to increase our personal effectiveness, most of us tend to drift and stagnate. Some people believe that planning is merely deciding what to do in the future. However, a better definition of planning is deciding what you have to do in order to have a future. The investment theory of work. Simply put, the investment theory of work states that you must be willing to sacrifice some of your present time, energy, and short-range satisfactions in order to work less and accomplish more later on. There is nothing new or earth-shaking about the investment theory of work, and all of us have used it from time to time. When you take a part-time job in addition to your regular duties to save for that new house or car, or when you go back to school for additional or advanced training, you are applying the investment theory. Most of us, however, don't rely on it systematically as a working principle in our lives. The reason for this is what I call the instant everything lifestyle. This has become a prevailing norm in our society. Pick up any newspaper, turn on the radio or television, or drive down any suburban highway, and voices from the land of instant everything will announce their readiness to satisfy your every need. Are you hungry or thirsty? There are fast food restaurants and express checkout supermarkets by the score. Dislike the way you are? There are literally thousands of establishments crying to make you taller, shorter, lighter, heavier, sexier, healthier, more beautiful, and smell better. 
Want to change your mood? There are pills and potions to pick you up, bring you down, keep you awake, and put you to sleep. The list could go on endlessly. It's the incredible miracle of 20th century living. One of the problems with instant everything is that it lulls us into neglecting the future. All that matters is the urgency of satisfying present needs. However, the future is not instant. It runs on a very precise schedule and takes its time getting here. To be sure, tomorrow is promised to no one, but it is also a fact that most of us will be here when it arrives. Fail to control your future, and it will control you. Your use of time and energy will be dictated by circumstances rather than by yourself. The relationship of you to time is always one of master to slave. There is no middle ground. The only question is which role you choose to play. Many of the ideas suggested in this book will at first be unfamiliar and uncomfortable, and involve a greater initial investment of work than old comfortable habits you have grown accustomed to. However, as the Queen told Alice in Lewis Carroll's Through the Looking Glass, it's a poor sort of memory that only works backwards. As your two-way memory looks forward, you will realize the rewards are indeed greater accomplishment coupled with less devotion of your time and energy. I happen to be one of those people who believe that happiness and success don't just happen to someone. They happen when opportunity meets preparation. Those who succeed do so because they were willing to invest in the groundwork and were prepared when the tide of good fortune rolled in. Working smart requires an investment of thought, self-discipline, and hard work, and the rewards are greater personal satisfaction and greater productivity with less stress and less effort. A word of warning. Old habits are extremely hard to break. Your first reaction to some of these new ideas may be to try them for a while and then give them up in favor of the old ways. It's always easier to do nothing, but I suggest you treat the development of personal productivity as a permanent behavioral change in your lifestyle. That will require patience, self-discipline, and a determination to succeed. Use your two-way memory and realize that the process of reprogramming yourself for greater personal productivity is going to be an investment with a great payoff down the road. Let's start looking at some investments that will save you time, energy, and aggravation. Chapter 2. Life's Ultimate Game Plan If you really know what things you want out of life, it's amazing how opportunities will come to enable you to carry them out. John M. Goddard Human beings are naturally goal-seeking creatures. When we have no goals, we live an aimless and purposeless life. The next time someone tells you they feel life is not worthwhile or that they are bored, take a closer look. What they are really saying is that they have no worthwhile problems to solve, obstacles to conquer, or goals to achieve. Developing a successful plan for effectiveness begins with goal setting. You can make a very good case that goals and the sense of purpose that accompanies them are necessary for survival. Actuaries report high incidences of poor health and death shortly after the mandatory retirement age. After 40 to 50 years in a job or career, it is understandable that someone feels stripped of his sense of direction and value when retirement is thrust upon him. Many of us reach retirement totally unprepared, with no other goals to pursue, and as a result, we rust out rather than wear out. Contrast the retirement syndrome to the fact that many creative people, such as artists and composers, often enjoy much greater than average longevity. Many live well into their 80s and 90s, and their final years are often the most productive. Unlike most of us, they die with their boots on. Am I saying that artists tend to live longer because they are more creative? That's not the point at all. Rather, I believe the artist's longevity is attributable to an unending and uninterrupted sense of purpose and direction. To these people, there is always another symphony to compose or canvas to fill. We can't all be artists, but we all need and can have goals. Of course, we all have some goals. However, the overwhelming majority of them are vague and poorly conceived. Few of us ever undertake the task of setting definite goals for our lives. Doing this would greatly increase the odds of working less and accomplishing more. Until we decide what we want, we aren't very likely to get it. In the meantime, we flounder around working more and accomplishing less by frittering away our time and energy aimlessly. Guidelines for setting goals Most of us recognize the importance of goals. However, when it comes to the task of setting specific goals, we back off or procrastinate. We feel We feel uneasy about it. 
planning our life seems like such an onerous task that most of us simply throw up our hands and say, in effect, I just don't know where to begin. Here is a program that will provide the structure you need to get you started on your way to meaningful goal setting. If you follow these instructions and guidelines, the task of goal setting will become far less burdensome. In fact, you will probably enjoy it. An exercise in self-discovery. It makes little sense to decide what you want out of life until you have a good idea of who you are. This is why the following self-discovery exercise precedes goal setting. Once you have established a sense of who you are, you will be in a better position to set meaningful goals. Take 10 index cards. On one side of each card, write, I am. Now take about 10 minutes and complete each statement differently. Work rapidly, as the objective of this exercise is to discover your true feelings about yourself. Don't censor any answers that come to your mind. Write them down. Answers such as gambler, alcoholic, or ping pong fiend are no less valid than answers like human being, parent, student, wife, homeowner, or sports fan. You may find you need more than 10 cards. That's fine. Use as many as you need. Some people find it difficult to come up with 10 answers. This is generally due to censoring their thoughts. If you encounter this problem, perform this exercise where you will be alone and undisturbed. Most of all, remember that there are no right or wrong answers. The key is spontaneity. When you have completed all 10 statements, read them over, arrange them in order of importance, and number them. Then turn over the first card and complete the following statement. This, I am, is first because. Do the same for the remaining cards, in order. A case study in goal setting, the Denny had story. Denny had, despite being financially successful as a stockbroker, found that the nature of the work didn't fit his temperament. He longed for something more tangible and felt frustrated by the inability to control his own destiny. Denny overcame his frustrations by realizing that only he and divine providence could control his destiny. An avid amateur radio operator since childhood, Denny decided to form the Dentron Radio Company to manufacture and sell equipment for ham radio operators. In April 1974, Denny quit his job, sold the family cars to acquire capital, borrowed heavily on credit cards, and began making amateur radio equipment in his basement. Dentron was born. Many of Denny's friends and relatives watched with sorrow and dismay, feeling certain that he had lost his mind. On August 28, 1974, Dentron Radio recorded its first sale. In April 1975, Dentron moved from Denny's basement to the Dentron plant in Twinsburg, Ohio. By the end of 1975, Dentron had grossed over $1 million in sales. Today, Denny Had is the owner and president of a growing multi-million dollar manufacturing and marketing operation that sells products to amateur radio enthusiasts and governments throughout the world. Boundless energy and enthusiasm for life characterize the Denny Had of today. The Denny Had method for achieving goals is simple. Once you decide on what you want, put on the blinders and move full speed ahead. Don't listen to anyone else because they will only tell you why something can't be done, says Denny. Not too surprisingly, his ulcer vanished years ago. Examples of different types of goals. Listed below are several examples of each type of goal. These examples are for illustration purposes only and are not meant to imply that any of these should or should not be your goals. If you think of a goal that falls into more than one category, write it down on each appropriate card. A goal appearing several times is usually a good one because it indicates a wide range of potential satisfaction to you. Career Goals Become president of the company by age 40. Get promoted this year. Find another career more in line with my tastes and aptitudes. Open my own restaurant. Get transferred to the home office. Become the top salesperson in my district. Get my boss's job. Get a job with my company's competitor. Quit work and become a college professor. Pass the CPA examination. Personal relationship goals. Devote two hours each day to getting to know my children better. Take at least one escape weekend every three months with my spouse. Try to meet at least one new person each day. Convert a former adversary into a friend. Fall in love. Get married. Get a divorce. Cultivate one new, close friendship each month. Learn to remember names. Evict my mother-in-law. Recreational goals. Find a better way to relax each day. Go on a safari. 
attend an orgy, get an amateur radio license and talk to people around the world, buy a boat, write a novel, take a trip around the world, raise Great Danes, sleep late on Saturdays, watch the sunset, personal growth goals, learn one new word each day, take a speed reading course, learn to make better use of my time and energy, attend a lecture on something I know little or nothing about each month, learn to control my temper, take up conversational French, go away to college, join the Marines, spend a night on skid row or in jail, volunteer for charity work, material goals, be financially independent in five years, buy a house this year, get a sports car, buy the best quadraphonic stereo, buy a motorcycle, buy a yacht and live on it, acquire rental property, add another bathroom to the house, earn enough money to pay off the mortgage, social goals, join the country club, make the dean's list, graduate with honors, run for political office, wear expensive clothes, move to an impressive neighborhood, throw formal dinner parties for important people, be captain of the football team, be chosen employee of the month, appear on radio or television as an expert, be sure to refer back to your self-discovery cards as you begin to write down your goals. They will be a great help in pointing the way toward which goals will be most meaningful. If, for example, one of your self-discovery cards says, I am a father, logical goals might be to set aside more time each week for getting better acquainted with your children or adding a family recreation room to your house. If one of your cards says, golfer, saving for a new set of clubs or resolving to lower your score by a few strokes by the end of the year would be potential goals. The idea is to use the self-discovery cards as a guide to which things in life are most meaningful to you. The reason for putting goals in writing is twofold. First, writing goals helps you identify more clearly what you want. Most of us never write down our goals. We are simply content to think about them. However, thoughts are fleeting and if our goals are merely thoughts, we run a high risk of having little more than daydreams. Written goals are less likely to be forgotten or lost in the shuffle. They are tangible and we are committed to achieving them. Secondly, putting goals in writing brings them closer to realization. The more vividly you can see, feel, and taste your goals in advance, the greater the probability of their accomplishment. Chapter 3. Master Your Chaos Organizing is what you do before you do something so that when you do it, it's not all mixed up. Christopher Robin in A.A. Milne's Winnie the Pooh. In one of his films, W.C. Fields plays an executive whose desktop is a morass of clutter. In one scene, he returns to his desk to find that an efficiency expert has organized, rearranged, and streamlined it. The desktop is now a picture of neatness and efficiency, but Fields is frustrated. He can't find anything. So, he vigorously throws the neat stacks of paper up in the air, tossing them as a gourmet would a salad. Then he backs off, surveys the desktop with satisfaction, deftly reaches into the pileup, and pulls out the desired document. To fully appreciate the satire of that scene, we should place it in historical perspective. At the time Fields was in his glory, efficiency experts were preaching the gospel of organization. One of the cardinal sins of inefficiency was to have a desk with anything on top of it other than the immediate work at hand. A clear desk was heralded as the badge of efficiency and productivity. Today, we are less sure of this. Certainly, a life of organization is usually much more effective than one of chaos. Most of us could enhance our effectiveness with more organization. However, hard and fast rules are not the order of the day when it comes to organizing. This is what W.C. Fields was trying to tell us in the film. We all must organize to suit our own personality and the task at hand. As you plan your life, Resist the temptation of becoming overly organized, it's an effectiveness killer. I had a friend in college who flunked out after one semester. The main reason was that he spent all of his study time reading various books on how to study and never got around to studying. The same problem can arise as you try to work smarter. Remember, these ideas are merely means to an end, and that end is to increase your lifetime effectiveness. Running around with a stopwatch and keeping a totally clear desk isn't going to accomplish what you want in life. Nevertheless, there are some good guidelines for organizing your life and your thoughts, and those are discussed in this chapter. Those are discussed in this chapter. 
If you practice these guidelines as guidelines rather than as hard and fast rules, you will find they will aid you in getting the most from your time and effort. With that thought in mind, let's look at a few of them. Chapter 4. Precision Tools for Perfect Results Thomas Carlyle once remarked, Man is a tool-using animal. Without tools he is nothing. With tools he is all. Those are words worth remembering. How many times have you labored at an unsuccessful activity only to find out that having a particular tool could have saved you a great deal of time, energy, and frustration? This type of experience is usually most apparent to us when we are trying to repair the family car or something around the house. This is because we tend to think of tools as tangible instruments, as many of them are. However, to make the most of this guideline, we have to use the word tool in a much broader context. A tool is anything you use to help you achieve your goals. No matter what your goals are or what activities you pursue, all of them involve tools. If you are an accountant, your tools include the obvious pencils, papers, and calculators, as well as your CPA certificate and your practical knowledge. If you work in an office, the office itself with its desk, chair, and floor space is a tool. Other examples of less obvious tools are automobiles, statistical tables, newspapers, foreign languages, and interviewing techniques. The list is endless. Before setting out to perform a task or achieve a goal, stop and ask yourself, what are the necessary tools to complete the task successfully, and do I have them? If you don't have the proper tools, first consider getting someone else to do the job. Your time, energy, and expenses may be greatly reduced by employing someone else. However, if it's something only you can do, make an effort to first equip yourself with the best tools available. The difference between wise men and fools is often found in their choice of tools. Organize your workspace. Consider the environment in which you will be performing the task. Organizing your workspace is largely a personal matter that depends on your own tastes and the job to be done. However, there are several basic factors to keep in mind. Location. If you are fortunate enough to choose your workspace, choose one that is conducive to performing the task. If the job requires concentration, look for a quiet, private place. On the other hand, if you are opening your own business, choose a well-traveled location where potential customers have easy access to your establishment. Space. After you have chosen the proper work location, measure how much space you have to work with. Most of us usually find we have less than we want. It helps to know what space is available before furnishing it with the necessary tools. Easy access to the tools you use frequently. Make a list of the tools you use and rank them in order of how often you use them. Then you will have a guide to arranging them for easiest access. Refrain from cluttering your workspace with non-essential items. The moose head you had mounted after your last hunting trip to Canada may well be a sight worth seeing, but if it distracts you, you should place it somewhere else. Besides, it may occupy space where a more useful tool such as a memo board could be put. Comfort. Some people don't believe that workspaces should be designed for comfort. They are generally people who play the hard work tape or the work is inherently unpleasant tape. The fact is that discomfort is a distraction that serves only to hinder productivity. Why make things more difficult than they have to be? Life is already filled with more than ample supplies of discomforts, distractions, and frustrations. A comfortable workspace generally has the proper seating, ventilation, and lighting. If you work sitting down for long periods, choose a firm, comfortable chair that gives good back support. Try to find one comfortable enough that you won't have to get up every 10 minutes, but not so comfortable that you will fall asleep in it. To avoid eye strain, use indirect, uniform lighting. Adequate ventilation will help prevent unnecessary fatigue from stuffiness in the work environment. Which temperature range you work best in is a personal matter. However, be sure to locate your place in the workspace out of a draft. Master the art of deskmanship. A great many of us perform some or all of our work at a desk. As I mentioned earlier, a desk is a tool, and it is one of the most abused and misused tools. So, before delving into the application of this tool and how to get the most from it, we ought to consider what a desk is not. Specifically, a desk is not a place to conduct a paper drive. Judging from the many cluttered desktops I've seen, I'm convinced that paper recyclers would fare better if they raided desktops in office buildings rather than collecting old newspapers from the local shopping center. A storage depot for food, clothing, umbrellas, and other non-job sundries. I once moved into an office only to find I was sharing a desk with a colony of ants. 
It seems that my predecessor had willed me a large open bag of candy in the top right-hand drawer, but the clever little devils had beaten me to it. A place to stack items you want to remember. A German executive once remarked to Alec McKenzie that desktops get stacked because we put things there we don't want to forget. The problem is that it works. Every time we look up, we see all these things we don't want to forget and our mind wanders, breaking our train of thought. With time, the stacks grow higher, and we forget what's in each one. So, we waste large amounts of time retrieving lost items and thinking about all those things we don't want to forget. Merrill Douglas, a time management consultant, tells of keeping a close time log on one executive who had a stacked desktop. The log revealed that he spent two and a half hours per day looking for information on the top of his desk. A status symbol or a place to display awards, trophies, and the like. This mistaken use of desks causes us only to make desks larger than they have to be. With more surface area, we have more room for clutter, and somehow more clutter magically appears to fill up any available space. Now that we have discussed what a desk is not, let's look at what a desk is. It's a tool that expedites the receiving and processing of information and should be utilized with those objectives in mind. You may have a desk and not need one. Lawrence Apley, former president of the American Management Association, remarked that most desks only bury decisions. Some executives have thrown out their desks and declared their effectiveness has increased. They have replaced the standard office desk and chair with a lounge chair, clipboard, small writing table on casters, and file cabinets. Advocates of the deskless office report an improvement in face-to-face -face communication and an atmosphere of greater freedom. They no longer feel chained to a desk. Consider the possibility that you may not need a desk and, if you can get rid of it, try working without it and see what happens. How to reorganize your desk for effectiveness. Assuming you do need your desk, here are some guidelines for getting the most out of it. Clear it off. One of my associates saw a movie where an executive had a busy office with papers stacked on his desk, on the floor, on the windowsills, and on every available surface. He asked a friend, who was an efficiency expert, what was wrong with that picture. The friend replied, everything. The movie showed the executive gathering all of the papers, throwing them up in the air, and reorganizing them as a gourmet would a salad. When he was done, the executive was ready to resume his work. However, he didn't find what he wanted. Chapter 5. New Attitudes for Effectiveness Attitude is a little thing that makes a big difference. Winston Churchill Life is shaped by attitude. How we spend our time and energy, particularly in work, reflects our attitudes. Our thoughts and feelings govern how hard we work and what we achieve. Throughout life, we adopt beliefs about ourselves, many of which are false, like old tapes repeating outdated messages. We've been conditioned to see feelings as mysterious and beyond control, and to equate real living with uncontrollable emotional highs. Responsibility for others' feelings and attitudes is also ingrained, burdening us unnecessarily. Better than you think. Undoubtedly, we underestimate ourselves. Self-evaluation often sells us short. Most people have untapped potential. Woody Hayes, renowned football coach, asserted that everyone exceeds their self-beliefs. Coach Bear Bryant echoed this, underscoring the untapped potential in individuals unaware of their abilities. Our self-image drives our behavior, a self-fulfilling prophecy where actions confirm beliefs. Whether we see ourselves as shy, capable, intelligent, or unworthy, our behavior aligns with these beliefs. However, many self-concepts are untrue or rationalizations. The strongest drive isn't self-preservation but maintaining self-image. Strengthening this is pivotal for effectiveness. Winners perceive themselves as such, increasing their success rates. Conversely, losers often fulfill negative prophecies. Disraeli noted, we create our fortunes and call them fate. Strengthen your self-image. A robust self-image empowers us to achieve and endure. Changing self-image demands willpower and discipline. Strategies to bolster self-worth include letting go of the past, erroneous past notions limit potential. Replace I lack initiative with I choose to act differently now. Set goals to counter old beliefs. Building on strengths, emphasize positive traits and past successes. Leverage these to achieve future goals. Recognize and maximize your strengths strategically. Unconditional self-acceptance. Your worth isn't tied to external achievements. 
Conditional acceptance breeds perpetual dissatisfaction. You're inherently valuable. Accept this. Defying external validation, relying on others' opinions undermines self-worth. Eleanor Roosevelt remarked, No one can make you feel inferior without your consent. Ignore detractors. Trust self. Prioritizing personal goals. Avoid subordinating your desires for others. Maintain self-satisfaction to nurture healthy relationships and productivity. Take charge of your life's direction. You control your thoughts and feelings. Effective work attitudes stem from understanding emotions' origins. Feelings aren't mystical but a product of thoughts. Control thoughts to regulate feelings. Choose happiness, confidence, or motivation consciously. Guilt, a bad case of shoulds. Guilt, conditioned since childhood, hampers effectiveness. It's futile, feeding on regret and past mistakes. It excuses inaction and garners pity, obstructing self-improvement. To overcome guilt, acknowledge the past's irreversibility. Focus on present actions. Allocate time for guilt and realize its energy drain. Set goals to move past guilt's grip. Accept mistakes, learn, and grow. Detach from guilt wielders. Worry. Futile future forecasting. Worry paralyzes with imagined future catastrophes. Most concerns are unfounded, wasting energy and time. Replace worry with proactive planning. Act on present opportunities rather than fretting. To combat worry. Reflect on past worries unrealized. List worst fears. Acknowledge their improbability. Confront worries head-on with action plans. Realize the futility of excessive worry. Redirect energy towards meaningful goals. Fear of failure. The imaginary wall. Fear of failure inhibits action and stifles potential. Failure is subjective. Animals don't comprehend it. Overcoming this fear involves embracing challenges and learning from setbacks. To conquer fear of failure. Recognize failures as learning opportunities. Reframe failure as a stepping stone to success. Challenge self-imposed limits. Reject the safety of inaction for the risks of growth. Support others' efforts despite setbacks. By shedding guilt, worry, and fear of failure, we pave the way for a more effective, fulfilling life. Embracing positive attitudes and self-belief propels us towards achieving our highest potential. Remember, attitude isn't just a small part of success, it defines it. The most vociferous critics are generally frustrated doers who are ruled by their own fear of failure. Those who give in to their fears and choose the psychological payoffs overlook one major point. Failure is not a measure of success. In fact, as we have already pointed out, failure isn't anything. In life, it isn't what you lose that counts, it's what you gain and what you have left. If you find yourself immobilized due to fear of failure, here are some ideas to help you overcome it. Set your own standards of success. Remember that failure is arbitrary. Don't allow your life to be ruled by standards other than your own. You don't have to be president of the company because your father was or your spouse wants you to be. It's your choice, not theirs. Don't fall into the trap of success-failure thinking. If you set a goal and pursue it, evaluate your own performance in terms of degrees of success. Don't feel you have to succeed or achieve excellence in everything you do. There's nothing wrong with a mediocre round of golf, at least that's what I keep telling myself, or a poor set of tennis, as long as you're having fun. Meet your fear of failure head-on. Find something you would like to do but fear failure in, and do it. Even if you don't succeed to the degree you hope to, you won't have any regrets. After all, you will be doing what you want to do. It's better to feel sorry for the things you've done than to regret missed opportunities. All ventures involve risk, but not to venture is to waste your life. If you do feel you have failed, recognize it as a learning experience that will make you wiser and contribute to later successes. Astute young politicians practice this. They join a political race fully realizing they have no chance of winning. However, by throwing their hat in the ring, they get public exposure and learn the ropes of campaigning. All of the exposure and learning can someday contribute to a victorious campaign. We can learn a great deal more from our failures than our successes, provided we avail ourselves of the opportunity. Realize that meaningful success is rarely easy and is usually preceded by struggle. However, it's those who have the will to see it through that make it. Most of us throw in the towel too soon when hanging in there a little longer would do the job. 
In his book, The Art of Selfishness, David Seabury strikes this analogy. In South Africa, they dig for diamonds. Tons of earth are moved to find a little pebble not as large as a little fingernail. The miners are looking for the diamonds, not the dirt. They are willing to lift all the dirt in order to find the jewels. In daily life, people forget this principle and become pessimists because there is more dirt than diamonds. When trouble comes, don't be frightened by the negatives. Look for the positives and dig them out. Last but not least is the final time and energy killer. Anger. If anything good comes from severe anger and its byproducts of hatred and bitterness, I've yet to see it. It certainly accomplishes nothing regardless of whether it's aimed at others, oneself, or inanimate objects. In the final analysis, the angry person is saying, the world and its people must live up to my expectations. Of course, such a demand is totally ridiculous. Anger starts wars, and unless we learn to control it, anger may lead to the total extinction of humanity. Like the other three immobilizing emotions, anger has its neurotic rewards. If you're angry at other things or people, then it's all their fault for not living up to your expectations. Therefore, you don't have to change. Anger can get you loads of sympathy, attention, and power over those who will allow you to manipulate them. Poor George, he has such a terrible temper. It's really a shame because he has such bad headaches, backaches, and high blood pressure as a result. Let's just do what he wants. God forbid what might happen if he gets mad. And besides, it's not his fault that he's such a sensitive, intense, and totally alive person. Anger gives you license to go temporarily insane, thus exonerating you from responsibility for unsatisfactory behavior. You can tell yourself and others, I don't know what came over me. I just lost my temper. Finally, anger is an excuse for incompetence. You can blame your bad temper for your inability to think straight or take constructive action. Of course, all of those payoffs are total wastes of time and energy. Getting out of your car and kicking the tires when you break down on the freeway isn't going to get you rolling again. However, the most self-destructive anger is that which is aimed at other people. The late Senator Hubert Humphrey put it best, bitterness takes too much energy and accomplishes nothing. It doesn't hurt the other person. You think you're sending out the rays of bitterness like laser beams, but they stay inside of you, consuming you. We live in an angry age typified by high crime rates, petty bickering, broken homes, and people suing each other at the drop of a hat. Whatever the reasons, there are lots of us who evidently feel that the solution to our problems is anger. How unfortunate. You are best off if you can eliminate your anger completely. If you can't eliminate anger, here are some useful ideas for coping with it. Vent your anger constructively. It isn't healthy to suppress anger, but there are constructive alternatives to venting it. For example, you can work your frustrations out with a regular exercise program. Sometimes a little anger can provide an additional spark to move you toward meeting your goals. For example, when I first started making plans to write this book, I mentioned it to one of my colleagues at work. He laughed at the idea and said it would never get written, much less published. I went home and started writing that day. His negative reaction was just what I needed to get me moving. How can I ever thank him enough? Take your work seriously, but not yourself. Ethel Barrymore put it best when she said, you grow up the day you have your first real laugh at yourself. There is absolutely no future in taking life too seriously. Our mental institutions and prisons are filled with people who have. Develop your sense of humor and use it frequently. It is impossible to laugh and be angry at the same time. A good sense of humor creates positive energy and prevents the negative emotions from clouding your life. Your life is a gift that you must give back to your creator one day. So enjoy it to the hilt and leave the long faces to those who are going to live forever. Accept the fact that many things in life will not live up to your expectations. This is hardly a perfect world, and I don't know about you, but I'd feel terribly out of place if it were. Practice accepting those things in life you cannot change. Tolerance and serenity are great antidotes to anger. Give your anger a rain check. If something bothers you, count to 10 or, better yet, tell yourself, I'll get mad about this tomorrow. Postponing anger is a good way to minimize it. Spontaneously unloading your anger on your boss, spouse, or secretary can escalate minor mishaps into major catastrophes. Postponing your anger can reduce the odds of that happening. Realize that you don't have to get mad.